there's physical findings for the immune system? Are you feeling my IgG or something? What physical findings are there in the immune system? They can't be physical findings, it's an immune system. It's too small to feel. Oh, hmm, what's that? What's that, oh, ow, hey, oh, ow, oh, e. What are those? They hurt, they're red. Most accurate test, there is no test. Therapy is pain medication, steroids. Those are erythema nodosum, and erythema nodosum is paniculitis. Paniculitis is inflammation of the panis. Penis? No panis. So penis is an inflammation localized paniculitis or inflammation of fatty subcutaneous <coughs> tissue. And it's associated with inflammatory disorders and immune disorders. It's associated with inflammatory bowel disease, like both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis can give erythema nodosum. And uh, other thing is streptococcal syphilis pregnancy. Now, I won't say the word causes, because we don't know what causes. We, don't, we can't say what causes it. What causes erythema nodosum? I couldn't tell you. I could say it's associated with sarcoid syphilis pregnancy coccidioidomycosis. What causes it? I don't know. There's no real therapy. You, you reverse it. You use pain medications and pain medications, non steroidals and sometimes steroids, and then, you know, control the underlying disease. So there's no real therapy for erythema nodosum. There is things you can do to just control the inflammation. Now, what's the pathology of that? Because this is dermatopathology physical findings. There is edema of this with a fibrinoid exudate, vibrant exudation, just oozing through. That's part of the reason why it becomes firm. There's neutrophils firm, neutrophils firm, vibrant exudate, fibrin exudate, and neutrophils inside that. We don't know that much because we don't biopsy these. We don't have to. But here's the key issue. Erythema nodosum is not a vasculitis. It's not a vasculitis. That's a biggie. Inflammation without vasculitis. Next section. Yeah. Now what is this? Red bumpy skin. Let's see. Painless. Doesn't hurt me. Doesn't hurt me. Doesn't hurt me. Doesn't hurt me. Flay. Painless. Painless. Maybe a little raised. Maybe a little raised. Now a child comes with abdominal pain, joint pain, and this rash. There's red cells in the urine. So there's urinary problems. There's glomerulonephritis. When you see red cells in the urine or red cell casts, when you see red cells in the urine or red cell casts, red cells in the urine or red cell casts is glomerulonephritis. GI joint, skin, and renal. GI joint, skin, and renal. GI joint, skin, and renal. What's found on a skin biopsy? You know this stuff? This is sometimes called leukocytoclastic. GI joint, skin and renal. IgA, it's what I see now. Leukocytoclastic. White cells eating red cells. Wow, it's like cannibal cells. <laughs> eating the red cells. Hanox Schonlein purpura, IgA nephropathy. What's the difference between Hanox Schonlein purpura and IgA nephropathy? Because Hanox Schonlein purpura, Hanox Schonlein purpura is not just nephropathy. Hanox Schonlein purpura is GI pain, abdominal pain, purpuric skin lesions, renal problem, joint. GI joint, skin, and renal. IgA is what's in the skin, the kidney biopsy. Now, I didn't say to biopsy them. I didn't say to biopsy it. I didn't say to biopsy it. I didn't say to biopsy it. It is the most accurate test. What is the most accurate test? Biopsy for IgA. What's the most common wrong answer? Blood tests for IgA. The most common wrong answer, wrong answer is IgA blood levels because they're not accurate enough. But this is an inflammatory immunologic mediated disorder. We don't know what happens that IgA all of a sudden starts wanting to kill off all parts of your body. The blood IgA levels are simply not reliable. Biopsy is really necessary because it gets better. It gets better. Why biopsy that little kid when it's going to get 
get better. It's going to get better on its own. Why would I biopsy that child? Hainlock, Sean Line, Purpura resolve spontaneously in the majority of patients. You just need to be able to recognize the red painless raised lesions. Red painless raised lesions of leukocytoclastic reactions. Now, steroids are used. I didn't say that they definitely work. I didn't say they really work. We use them. Do they work? Well, I don't know. It's like deodorant, man. We use it. Does it work? Well, it covers it up, makes you feel better. Steroids used for refractory cases. Ooh, pretty. IgA in small vessels. That's inflammatory. Look at that. This is an immunofluorescent stain. That's why it fluoresces because this is tagged IgA. This is tagged IgA in an immunofluorescent stain of the skin. This is IgA in the glomerulus. And they might say, how do I know it's IgA by looking at it? You don't. But then again, I don't either. How do I know? I don't know and you don't know. I'm telling you because when we do immunofluorescence, it ends up being tagged with IgA. This is IgA inside the kidney as well. And this is part of Hainlock Charline Purpura, GI joint, skin, and renal. And when it's here by itself, it's IgA nephropathy. We don't have any good therapies for IgA nephropathy. And we don't have any good therapy for Hainlock Charline Purpura. I'm telling you that we only biopsy in Hanox Online when the person's getting worse and we don't know what else to do. Now, here, IgA vasculitis, inflammation of the glomerular capillaries. There they are. How do I know it's IgA? We know it's IgA when I tell you that we use a serum to IgA, not by physically looking at it, but by an anti-IgA serum. Then we know that's antibody reacting to that. Uh, antibody, anti-IgA antibodies. Now, this is inflammation of the small vessels that makes the leukocytoclastic reaction. And the only way you can know is you have to specifically be able to test for IgA in skin and kidney. No treatment most of the time. Next one. What is that? Ooh. Malar rash. Malar rash. What's it associated with? Lupus, SLE, ANA double stranded DNA, ANA double stranded DNA, and the treatment for malar rash of lupus. 50 years ago, we used hydroxychloroquine. Now we use hydroxychloroquine. Those are the malar rashes of lupus. ANA, double strand the DNA. It's the malar rash of lupus. It's associated with SLE. Now, it's less red, less hot, less warm than erysipelas. Less red, less hot, less warm than erysipelas because erysipelas is rhubardolar calor tumor, rhubardolar calor tumor, rhubardolar calor tumor in erysipelas. But Malar rash of lupus, a little more calm, a little more calm. Now, if both of them are indurated and raised up, however, lupus is not itchy. That's one thing. The other thing is it's also more permanent. Erysipelas is acute and simple, acute and one time. Well, how do we know it's not the first time for the malar rash? That's what we have blood tests for. The skin biopsy shows immunofluorescent staining. That is the most accurate test. Again, what's the most accurate? Okay, the most accurate excludes infection with biopsy of that skin. And ANA is there in 95 to 99%. ANA is present in almost everybody. It's just terribly non-specific. It's just terribly non-specific. Double strand the DNA, anti-Smith. Treat it with steroids because it's malar rash of lupus. Double strain the DNA is present in about 60%, but very, very specific. The only test more specific than a double strain of the DNA is the anti Smith. The only one. Did you know there's something more specific? There is. The problem with anti Smith is it's only there 20% of the time. These are tests to worry about when the ANA is positive and double-stranded DNA is negative. How do you make a diagnosis when ANA is positive and double-stranded DNA is negative? What if you're not sure? What is the meaning of anti-Rho? 
When you see anti-rho, it means it's time to do neonatal lupus testing. It's time to do little baby EKGs because you might have little baby heart block. Anti-rho in lupus indicates neonatal lupus. Who's this dude? What's he got? This guy is Seal, married to Heidi Klum. You can have Heidi Klum if you have discoid lupus. Even if you have discoid lupus. So this is discoid marks in his face. Discoid lupus with Seal. Next one. What's there? What's there? What's there? Ooh, big juicy hilar nodes. Big juicy hilar nodes. Big juicy hilar nodes. What's in there? Big, those big juicy What's in there with those big, juicy hilar nodes? So a man with dry cough and right crackles on ex exhalation and skin lesions. And if I tell you it's an African-American woman, you'd know right away the diagnosis. Crackles on inhalation, skin lesions known as lupus pernio. It affects every organ in the body, but not all of them are symptomatic. It can affect every organ in the body, but not all are symptomatic. The most accurate test is a biopsy. You want a piece of me? You want a piece of me? Okay, go ahead, take a piece of me. Take a piece of my lung. This is sarcoid of the face. It's known as lupus Pernio, biopsy steroids, biopsy steroids. Look for kosher granulomas. That is meat without cheese, non cheesiating kosher granulomas. That's what you'll look for with sarcoidosis. Skin lesions like this is called lupus pernio, and the dry cough and bilar retinopathy, the dry cough and bilateral hilar retinopathy, the dry cough and bilateral hilar retinopathy tells you that you've got sarcoidosis. Now, lupus pernio can be distracting because it's not clear. Most people don't know that outside the lung lesions, most people don't know that skin is the most common site of sarcoid. They think about sarcoid causing facial palsy, but rare. Sarcoid causing restrictive cardiomyopathy, but rare. You're thinking of sarcoid, amyloid, hemochromatosis, cancer and fibrosis, restrictive cardiomyopathy, sarcoid, amyloid, hemochromatosis, cancer and fibrosis, restrictive cardiomyopathy, but that's rarer than skin. Sarcoid can affect every organ in the body, but the liver and the kidneys and most of the other areas are not symptomatic. The plaque-like lesions are just make people uncomfortable. But they don't go anywhere, they don't develop into anything. The most accurate test is a biopsy. Non-caseating granulomas. ACE levels are like garbage. If the, they just don't help you very much. Because, they, yeah, ACE levels can be up in 60%, but, you know, if it means if they're not up, you can still have sarcoid, and if they're up, they're not the most specific thing in the world. Uh, steroids has always been the only therapy for sarcoid because 98% of the people get better with steroids. To be honest with you, most people get better with nothing. We just give the steroids to help you get it better faster. High lar nodes, skin, high calcium and only 10%. No other physical findings, skin. Ooh, look at this cloudy stuff in there. You know what those little dots are? Those are collections of white cells inside the cornea. This is on the inside, like goo, like the fish uh, sticking to the, to the uh, inside of the, of the uh, fish bowl when things are dirty inside the fish tank. This is uveitis. It happens in sarcoid. This is a picture of a steroid deficiency. This is a, it looks like a glomerulus, doesn't it? But it's not a glomerulus. It's a granuloma. It's a non-caseating, non-cheesiating, non-caseating granuloma. Non-caseating granuloma. Next one. The immunologic problem we have here is scleroderma. And scleroderma has sclerodactyly. Scleroderma has SCL70. Scleroderma, the most accurate test, SCL70. Scleroderma involves central organs. Scleroderma, treatment sucks. Scleroderma, the treatment sucks. There really is no precise treatment for scleroderma itself. We give cyclophosphamide for lung disease. 
Let me give some calcium blockers when there's Raynaud's. There isn't really a scleroderma drug. The sclerodactyly is a manifestation of systemic sclerosis. Remember, systemic sclerosis is scleroderma. And sclerodactyly ooh, is just part of the Crest syndrome. Now, what's the difference then between the Crest syndrome, a very nice name, good acronym, calcinosis, Raynaud's, esophageal dysmotility, and telangiectasia, what's the difference between Crest syndrome and systemic sclerosis? Systemic sclerosis would be much more, what's that right word? Systemic. Systemic sclerosis it affects the heart, the lung, the kidneys. Systemic sclerosis, the heart, the lung, the kidneys. Which blood test is most likely to be positive is actually an ANA. Most people don't know that. The blood test most likely to be positive in scleroderma and in Sjogren's syndrome, by the way, is an ANA in almost everybody. Anticrestomere and anticrestomere. Oh, I'm so sorry. What a Freudian slip. I must have meant to say anticentrovir antibodies. SCL70 is for scleroderma. These are not great ones. The SCL70, which is anti-toporosomerase, that's the same thing. SCL70, toporosomerase, that's really saying the same thing. They're present in a small number of people who have systemic sclerosis. SCL70 is present in about 30%. Well, then how am I going to know it's scleroderma, Connie? I wouldn't make a diagnosis of scleroderma. You never make me make a diagnosis of scleroderma. I want to make a diagnosis of scleroderma. And this blood test sucks. You never let me have any fun. I ended up having to consult people. I feel so stupid. That's probably true. You know how they say there's no such thing as a stupid question? They're wrong. SCL70 is present in 30% of patients. Centromeres is more often in crust. Systemic sclerosis involves the heart, the lung, and the kidney, scleroderma kidney. Next one, what is this guy's face? It's going into the mucous membranes, going to the mucous membranes. He recently got started on phenytoin. Uh-oh! Well, no, 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 I didn't even say just phenytoin alone. It was phenytoin with sulfa drugs. Uh-oh! It was phenytoin with sulfa drugs that had allopurinol. Actually, it was allopurinol encased in, um, in a sulfa drug and this is Stevens Johnson syndrome and the most common causes where it goes into the respiratory tract into the respiratory tract is penicillin sulfa drugs allopurinol phenytoin rifampin penicillin sulfa drugs allopurinol phenytoin and rifampin and also quinidine lamotrigine quinidine lamotrigine the rash that causes Stevens Johnson is called Stevens Johnson once it goes into the mucous membranes like the respiratory tract. The Stevens Johnson syndrome is a hypersensitivity reaction. It's a hypersensitivity reaction, Stevens Johnson. The Stevens Johnson syndrome is like toxic epidermal necrolysis as a diffuse sloughing of skin, mucous membranes. It's like toxic epidermal necrolysis because it can go into the respiratory tract, eyes and mouth and eyes and mouth. It's like toxic epidermal necrolysis in that steroids don't help. The lungs can be involved in Stevens Johnson as the respiratory epithelium gets sliced off going right inside the lungs. And that's why it might, request, it might require mechanical ventilation because that stuff that's going on inside his mouth, that's what makes it Stevens Johnson, by the way. It makes it Stevens Johnson because it's going in mucous membranes. That's what makes it Stevens Johnson because it's going in mucous membranes and can put you on a ventilator. So the most common uh, thing is penicillin, sulfa drugs, allopurinol, phenytoin, ripampin, nonsteroidals. It's the same drugs, by the way, that cause autoimmune hemolysis. Autoimmune hemolysis, penicillin, sulfa drugs, allopurinol, phenytoin, rifampin, quinidine, lamotrigine, that's autoimmune hemolysis. These are allergenic substances and steroids don't help. This is a hard one for medical students. 
They're like, no, please, I want to give steroids. No, Johnny, Johnny. Steroids won't help with Steven Johnson. Oh, please, you never let me give steroids. I want to give some steroids. It won't help. Intravenous hemoglobins. Really? Yeah. Use your intravenous hemoglobins or you won't. Stop this, because these are people. <gasps> Stevens Johnson syndrome, sloughing the mucous membranes, eyes and mouth, and eyes and mouth. <gasps> going into the mucous membrane. Stevens Johnson. This is the splitting of the skin. This is the photomicrograph. This is the dermatopathology of Stevens Johnson. And the dermatopathology of Stevens Johnson is it sloughs off that skin and there's not much you can do about it. So let's review the four types of hypersensitivity reactions. The four types of hypersensitivity reactions, type one immediate hypersensitivity, an allergen comes in, it activates the, uh, the mast cells and they have a premature ejaculation known as, known as a person who is losing his granules, degranulation. So type one hypersensitivity is allergens causing degranulation. Type 2 is the test that we might use for like a Coombs test. Type 3 is antibody antigen complexes. Type 4, which is Stevens Johnson, is that these antigen presenting cells activate T4s and T8s, T4s and T8s. Type 4 is the Stevens Johnson. Now, what you see here is you see an abnormal number of cytotoxic T cells or CD8 cells. This is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. And that's Stevens Johnson. Immunoman. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I will now act out tensilon testing. First of all, how is it performed? You've got to find, for edrophonium testing to work, a person who's got really like obvious physical finding. It's got an obvious physical finding, or you won't be able to know when it got better. Number two, what do you do? You, okay, okay, uh, the, the test that's used for is from myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis has to be confirmed with single fiber electron, uh, electromyography. You confirm it with single fiber electromyography. This is a guy who's droopy, 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 because what ends up happening when you get real ptosis, you end up having this little, like, ugh, like popping your own eyelids up by trying to look at it. Okay? So this is a guy with clear and obvious ptosis. Now, acetylcholine receptor antibodies are far more sensitive and specific. But tensilon or edrophonium testing can be done if you see a specific physical finding and you want to give etrophonium to see if there's an immediate improvement. If this is real, there'll be an immediate improvement if that's the diagnosis of myeloma. Tensilon testing for acetylcholinesterase inhibition, uh, like etrophonium, basically okay, tells you that this is myasthenia gravis. Now, if the test is positive, meaning I give, like look at Mr. Droopy Eyes here, in order to test this person, you'd be like, uh, 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 hi, how are you? And then you give him the edrophonium, you give him the edrophonium, no joke now, no, no joke. You give the edrophonium, and it's like, uh, how did you all get here? Brave new world that has such people in it. You need a direct, measurable, clear, physical finding that you can see if it improved. If the test is positive, the ptosis and the extraocular movements improve right away. And it's very hard to say that you've got a clear and obvious physical finding that will improve right away. With Tensilon, that is, makes it clear enough, it's used to evaluate because it lives a very short period of time, one or two minutes. The most accurate test, or like when you're unclear, we actually, okay, for this, we use an electron myogram, electromyography, and with electromyography, we put a needle in someone and twitch them, twitch them, twitch them, twitch them, 
and see how long it takes for them to stop twitching. That's electromyography. Single fiber electromyography is the most accurate way of diagnosing myasthenia gravis. So you're going to look for in that electromyography decreased amplitude and contraction with more stimulation. That's what you're going to look for. So the best initial test is actually a receptor antibody. An antibody, let's do this again, receptor antibodies, an antibody to the acetylcholine receptor, that's what the best initial test is. That's the best initial test because the problem that you have here is that you have a person who doesn't have enough receptors. This is normal. Here there's not enough receptors because they've been damaged by those acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Autoantibody against acetylcholine receptors. So this is the best initial test. Antibodies against acetylcholine receptors. That's the best initial test. Single fiber electromyography is the most accurate test. Next one. So what is it? Is it a rash or is it just urticaria? Is it a rash or is it anaphylaxis? Is it a rash or is it anaphylaxis? Well, it is a type of rash and it is a type of anaphylaxis. Well, if we have a rash with anaphylaxis, the answer is always very easy, which is antihistamines, epinephrine and steroids, antihistamines and steroids. So this is urticaria. Now, it, when you're looking at giving penicillin to someone, if the patient has had just a rash to penicillin, you can very safely and easily give a cephalosporin without worrying about it at all. But if you've had anaphylaxis, you should not use penicillin. You should either desensitize or switch to a different set of drugs. Either desensitize or switch to a different set of drugs. Now, does urticaria count as anaphylaxis? Yes, it does. Because it's an immediate hypersensitivity. It's from histamine released by mast cells. That is why you get this red stuff raised in your skin. Because it's histamine releasing mast cells. That's why. Now, the histamine releasing from that mast cells happens with medications, penicillin, sulfa drugs, alpurinol. Acutely, it's bugs, drugs, and foods. Acutely, it's bugs, insect bite, drugs, medication, foods. Like, I didn't know I was allergic to sugar or allergic to apricots. I didn't know I was allergic to pistachios. I didn't know I was allergic to apricots. That happens to people who are vegetarians often. Okay. But chronically, once you know that peanuts are going to make it so you can't breathe, you'll probably not have peanuts a whole lot. Once you know that chocolate can't make you breathe, you probably won't eat chocolate a lot. So acutely, it's bugs, drugs, and foods. But chronically, it's not just insect bites. Chronically, it is from pressure, cold, and vibration. Chronically, the histamines are released, and you can have it from pressure, cold, and vibration. And so remember, urticaria is anaphylaxis. It may be a little localized anaphylaxis, but it's anaphylaxis. That's why, that's why epinephrine is used to try and reconstrict those blood vessels. Oh, look at this. Skin writing. This is urticaria. Pressure, cold, and vibration. Pressure, cold, and vibration. The pressure of a cold vibrator. The mechanism of urticaria, is it immediate, type 1, or delayed, type 4? Immediate, type 1, or delayed, type 4? And the answer is, is that urticaria is an immediate hypersensitivity reaction that makes people very itchy and uncomfortable. It causes premature ejaculation of your mast cells, which say early degranulation. And all we can do in the presence of this mess when we want to say, hey, I just want to move on with it. I don't want to argue if it's urticaria, okay, it's anaphylaxis. Here's the antigens going through. And they have to be presented to the mast cells so you can get histamine release, so you can look like a good citizen of the Milky Way here. Now, looking at the different types of antigen and immunologic 
connections, subcutaneous antigens, subcutaneous antigens usually get picked up by T cells, also known as dendritic cells, and then there's mast cell activation making histamine come out, and after there's mast cell activation, Mr. Histamine come out, we have fluids and cells and proteins leaking out. So that's why this is an immediate hypersensitivity. You're treated with epinephrine and steroids. And urticaria is an indispensable, must-know, physical finding because this urticaria chronically, pressure, cold, and vibration, pressure, cold, and vibration, still needs to get suppressive therapy with antihistamines. Immunology, I bet you didn't know there were that many physical findings in immunology. See you in the next section.